This is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and in this video I'd like to provide uh, students in the Academy's Classical Logic course with a guided reading through the first lesson in the course. By a guided reading, I mean that uh, I'm going to read through the text and make some comments that I think will be helpful for students. So let's just go ahead and get started. Again, this is lesson one in the Academy's Classical Logic One course. In every instance in which we reason in the strict sense of the word, that is, make use of arguments, and I mean real, that is, valid arguments, in every instance in which we reason, whether for the sake of refuting an adversary, or of conveying instruction, or of satisfying our own minds on any point. Whatever may be the subject we are engaged on, a certain process takes place in the mind, which is one and the same in all cases, provided it be correctly conducted. So in this first paragraph, you should seek the main idea. And you should seek the main idea for each paragraph that you read, especially when you're asked to outline your reading. So in this first paragraph, uh, the, the main idea very simply is that there is one process. There is one process, and it's the same in all cases for all people. Because the process of reasoning is natural for human beings. And this is important because if it wasn't one, if there wasn't one single process, it would be impossible for us to get a hold of the art of reasoning. But because we know there is one process of reasoning, we can pretty easily learn how to reason rightly. And once we learn to reason rightly, we can apply that knowledge, use that knowledge for all different questions in all different subject areas whether, as he says, we're trying to refute an adversary, convey instruction to someone, or simply answer a question of our own. There is one process for reasoning, and therefore we can pursue the knowledge of this through the art of reasoning. Let's keep reading here. Second paragraph. Of course, it cannot be supposed that everyone is even conscious of this process in his own mind, much less is competent to explain the principles on which it proceeds. So, though we can say that this process of reasoning is true for every person and on every subject, that doesn't mean that everyone understands or is conscious of that process. We have to actually study the science of reasoning, in order to become conscious of that process and make sure we follow it. When we are thinking through an issue or discussing a topic, we've got to become conscious through the study of the science and then always hold ourselves and others accountable to that science. This indeed is and cannot but be the case with every other process respecting which any system has been formed. The practice not only may exist independently of the theory, but must have preceded the theory. In other words, this process of reasoning is natural. It takes place in us. Some people are naturally more careful in reasoning, other people less so. But in history, where this science came from was wise men studying men who were very gifted in the right use of reasoning. And by studying them, the principles of the science, the principles of the art, were drawn out and set into a system. So it's important to understand that the process of reasoning existed first. It exists in us naturally, just like muscular strength exists in us naturally, but it has to be cultivated. It has to be developed. Same is true for reasoning. 
And same is true for other arts and sciences, which we're going to see in this next sentence. There must have been a language, people must have been speaking, before a system of grammar could be devised. There must have been musical compositions, even though they may have been very basic. There must have been music produced before a science of music could be developed. This, by the way, will serve to expose the futility of the popular objection against logic that men may reason very well who know nothing of it. Some people may think that reasoning is just a gift and some people are just good at it by chance. People talk about this um, people talk about writing like this as well. Someone will say, oh, I'm just, I'm just not a good writer, but Tommy, he's a really good writer, or I'm not a good singer, or whatever. These are arts, and therefore it, it's not proper to speak of them as if they're just dependent upon talent, like we're born with it or we're not born with it. These are arts. These can be, these can be learned by study and practice. Music can be learned. Um, Proper grammar can be learned, and the same is true of reasoning. Some will say you either have it or you don't, but the author of this textbook tells us not only is that true for language, or not only is that false for language and for music, it's also false for reasoning. You don't either have it or you don't. It's an art that can be learned by study and practice. The parallel instances adduced, that is, these other examples of arts that have been provided, show that such an objection might be, applied, might be applied in many other cases where its absurdity would be obvious. It would be absurd if you tried to argue that people have whatever skills they have just by birth, just by chance or or natural talent alone, that could easily be proven false by looking at the different individuals who perform these arts and, and investigating whether they simply had this from birth or whether they studied and practiced and cultivated these arts. The argument that it's just from birth would be absurd. That there is no ground for deciding thence either that the system has no tendency to improve practice or that even if it had not, it might not still be a dignified and interesting pursuit. So it's, it's absurd to make an argument that studying the art and science of reasoning won't help us to reason more effectively, even reason more effectively than those who may be naturally gifted but who don't study the art. Just as in other areas of life, in sports, in music, in other skills, some people do have natural abilities, it seems, where they have a special natural talent in a certain area. But if they don't cultivate that talent, if they don't study the art and cultivate it, they'll often be outperformed by less talented people who study and work harder than they do. And so no matter how talented or how naturally gifted we may judge ourselves to be with respect to the, to the process of reasoning, the study of the art, the practice of the principles of the art will help us to become very effective in reasoning. Third paragraph here. One of the chief impediments, one of the chief obstacles to the attainment of a just view of the nature and object of logic is not fully understanding or not sufficiently keeping in mind the sameness of the reasoning process in all cases. In other words, this isn't a mystery. Once we understand the process of reasoning and we understand that that process in, is the same in all different areas, on all different subjects. The process of reasoning is always the same. Once we understand that, the greatest obstacle 
to the study of and use of reasoning is taken away. If, as the ordinary mode of speaking would seem to indicate, mathematical reasoning, theological reasoning, metaphysical reasoning, and political reasoning, and so on, were essentially different from each other, that is, different kinds of reasoning, if that was true, that these were actually different kinds of reasoning that require different reasoning processes, it would follow that supposing there could be at all any such science as we have described logic, there must be so many different species of logic, or at least so many different branches of logic. So if it was true that there were all different kinds of reasoning that was needed, then there would need to be different, different sciences or arts of logic that applied to these different areas. But that's not true. Reasoning is universal. Once we understand the process of reasoning, it's the same process for all these different subject areas. This is perhaps the most prevailing notion. People think that if you are able to reason in one area, you're not able to, to reason in another, but only the experts in those areas can speak about those subjects, but that's not true. Nor is this much to be wondered at, since it is evident to all that some men converse and write in an argumentative way very justly on one subject, but very erroneously on another subject. So when we look at many men, we see that they may be brilliant in one subject area and then say things that are foolish in another subject area. And our experience with people who are like that leads us to think that there must be different reasoning processes necessary because this person seems really good at work you know, let's say he's an accountant. He can do his accounting at, at work very well, but when he comes home, his household is very poorly organized and managed. So there must be different kinds of reasoning needed for accounting work and household management. And the author of our textbook says, no, that's not true. He's simply not applying the principles in both places. The reasoning process is the same. He does many things at work that are wise and then doesn't practice the same things, doesn't think with the same principles at home. And that's why it appears some men may be good in one thing and not good at another thing. It's just because they're not applying the successful principles in both places. But that appearance causes some to, to, to agree with this idea that there's different kinds of reasoning some people are good at one and not another, and that's why people have this, this, this trouble in their lives. It seems to support that idea, but it's false. This error may be at once illustrated and removed by considering the parallel instance of arithmetic. So if we think about arithmetic as an example, we can do away with this, this false idea about reasoning. In arithmetic, everyone is aware that the process of calculation, the process of calculation, is not affected by the nature of the objects that are being calculated. The numbers of the objects are before us, but the multiplication of a number is the same operation, whether it be a number of men that we're multiplying or a number of miles, or a number of pounds. If there are different subjects or different objects that we're calculating, the process of calculation is the same for all of them. And the same is true of reasoning. That's what the author is arguing here. Nevertheless, persons may perhaps be found who are accurate in the results of their calculations relative to natural philosophy or natural science and incorrect in those of political economy or economics. So the same problem may appear, but it's not because the arithmetic, not because the process of calculation is different, 
they're simply not practicing good calculation, good arithmetic in the two different areas. This may be caused by their different degrees of skill in the subjects of these two sciences. Not because there are different arts of arithmetic applicable to each of these respectably, respectively. So it may seem that there are different mathematical processes, but that's not true. I can give an example of this. When I was a kid, I struggled in mathematics in school. I didn't like studying math in school, and I, I was the kind of kid who went around saying, I'm not good at math. I was one of those kids. I didn't like school math, but at the same time, when I was playing baseball, I could calculate my batting average. I, can cal I could calculate my statistics. I could be playing in the middle of a game, and I could be standing on second base and calculate my batting average. And that was the same arithmetic that I was studying in school. But for some reason, uh, in school, I wasn't good at it. And yet, when I wanted to figure something out, when I wanted to calculate something, and it was a subject I was interested in, a subject that I knew a lot about, lo and behold, I was able to do all the calculations, the same calculations that I was asked to do in my math classes. And so we can see that it's, it's a strange situation, but sometimes it appears that there might be a baseball math that somebody's good at, and then a school math that he's not good at, but that's really not true. It's the same process in both places. One of the challenges of teaching is helping students to understand that, that, you know, we learn this in our English composition course. We learn that one reason why students don't like to write is because teachers often select topics that the children aren't interested in or don't know anything about, and that appears to make writing uh, difficult for them. But they can talk very easily with their friends about things they're interested in, and yet the, the assignments in the writing classes cause it, appear, cause it to appear that they're not good writers. And the students may walk away and say, I'm not a good writer. But that's not true. We have to write about topics that we, we have experience with and that we're interested in. That's a necessary part of writing. So we shouldn't say we're not good at the process or the skill we just have to learn to, to really understand that process, to really understand the art and understand how it applies in different situations, in different subject areas. Let's keep going here with the next paragraph, and this is the last paragraph of this lesson. Others, again, who are aware that the simple system of logic may be applied to all subjects whatever, are yet disposed to view it as a peculiar method of reasoning and not as it is a method of unfolding and analyzing our reasoning. It's a universal method. It's a universal art or science. We're studying the art or the faculty of reasoning that exists in us by nature. So it's not something artificial, not something peculiar that's outside of us for us to study. It's actually something that's natural, that's in us by nature. And we're understanding our own thinking processes because we do this naturally, but we're often not conscious of it, and we often act contrary to it. But this is present in us. This system of logic is designed into us by God, and we're simply studying to understand it, to become more conscious of it, to make better use of it. Before, I, I referred to muscles, and it's, it's really helpful to think of reasoning as a muscle. We're all born with muscles, but some of us study how to use those muscles and work to train those muscles, making them flexible and strong, and those who do so can use them more effectively than those who don't. The same is true with reasoning. The same is true with reasoning. God has given us the capacity for great reasoning, just as he's given us the capacity for great physical strength. But we've got to do our part 
as rational creatures, we've got to do our part to cultivate those natural faculties or powers that God has given us to actually allow them to fulfill their potential. We do that in, with our muscles, we do that through exercise. With reason, we do it through study and practice and reasoning. So this is not something outside of us, something peculiar to some or, or something artificial that we learn and add to ourselves. It's something that's already in us, but it's undeveloped. He then refers to another book that we're not going to read, so let's just read over this quickly. Um, just to go over that part again, others who are aware that the simple system of logic may be applied to all subjects, whatever, are not disposed to view it as a peculiar method of reasoning and not as it is a method of unfolding and analyzing our reasoning. Whence many have been led, for example, this one author, but many, to talk of comparing syllogistic reasoning, and we'll, we'll learn what this, this word syllogistic means in, uh, in one of our next lessons, so don't worry about that, comparing one kind of reasoning, syllogistic reasoning, with moral reasoning, taking it for granted that it is possible to reason correctly without reasoning logically, and that makes no sense which is in fact as great a blunder as if anyone were to mistake grammar as, as an art that applies to all languages for a peculiar language and to suppose it possible to speak a language correctly without speaking grammatically. That's not possible. They have, in short, considered logic as an, notice he put an in italics, they have considered logic to be an art of reasoning or one kind of art of reasoning, whereas it is the one and only art of reasoning. The logician, note that word logician, a person who studies and teaches logic is called a logician. The logician's object being not to lay down principles by which one may reason, but by which all must reason, because there's only one process, only one way to do it. It's not just one option. It's the only way. Even though they are not distinctly aware of them, to lay down rules, not rules which may be followed with advantage, but rules which cannot possibly be departed from in sound reasoning. These misapprehensions, misunderstandings, and objections, being such as lie on the very threshold of the subject, these, are, these issues, these problems are right at the front door, as it were, of the study of logic. It would have been hardly possible without noticing them to convey any just or true notion of the nature and design of the logical system. So that brings us to the end of the reading for chapter 1. So we see one main idea in this first chapter. We see that the author of the textbook, first of all, he, he argues that Reasoning is a natural process that exists in us by nature. It's not something outside of us. It's not something we can choose to use or not use or use in one situation and not use in another situation. It's a universal power that applies to all situations. It's a process that we use no matter what we're doing, no matter what we're studying, no matter what we're talking about. It's one and the same process. And anyone who tries to say, well, you know, that's one way of doing it, but I think that's not true. There's not a number of different ways to reason. And it doesn't matter if we're studying science or philosophy or religion or mathematics. The reasoning part of those subjects is the same. And so you can see right at the beginning here, and this is why he, he wrote about this in the very first chapter, 
it's important for us to understand this because we can see just how valuable and important reasoning is to our studies because as we develop mastery of the art and science of reasoning, we're going to be able to apply it to every area of our life and studies. It's a tool that works on every project. Think of it like that. Think if there was a tool that no matter whether you were doing woodwork or working on a car or repairing a computer, any kind of work you were doing, there was a tool that was useful in every different kind of work. That's the kind of tool. That's the kind of of power that reasoning is. And we've got to understand that when we get started. We've got to understand that it's natural to us and it's necessary for us. It's natural and it's necessary. So that's the main idea of this first chapter. Now I've given you a a guided reading through the chapter. What I would like you to do, and really what you need to do, is Read this chapter through on your own. After watching this video, you should have a good idea of what the chapter is about, but I want you to read the lesson yourself because I want you to have a knowledge of the text so that you can answer questions about reasoning, you can understand the the content of the lessons that we learn, and you can know where you learned it from. You learned it from the text, and you can look at this text, read through this text, and say, I understand this text. So don't just listen to the video. I want you to go back after you've listened to this talk, and I want you to read that first chapter for yourself and make sure you understand everything that's in that chapter. Read it slowly. Read it out loud. Take notes. You know, Write an outline of the most important points, and make sure you understand everything in that first chapter. If there's anything in there that you don't understand, then go on the course page on the study center and post your questions on the course forum. And I'll respond to them and and help you with, with any details that you have any difficulty with. So commit yourself to studying the art of reasoning. Commit yourself to really mastering these lessons, asking questions when there's something that you don't understand. Don't just fudge your answers and try to get through assignments. Really study this subject and try to master it and understand it because it's the most useful of all studies. It's a study that if you become skillful in the art of reasoning, if you become masterful in the science of reasoning, it's going to change all of your studies and help you in every area of life. That's why I want you to take this study seriously and make sure you understand everything you read in the lesson. So do the reading on your own. You can rewatch this video if you'd like to. That's fine. And then once you've you've read through and studied the lesson on your own, work on the assignment. The assignment's going to ask you to summarize the lesson. It's going to ask if there's any any new uh, concepts or vocabulary items that you've come across in this lesson. Complete that assignment and try to get a a perfect score on your first try. Make that your goal. And I'll continue to uh, prepare these guided readings for you and we'll work through classical logic together. I hope that's a helpful guide. It's time for you to study on your own. God bless your studies.